Has there ever been any other number to enchant the human curiosity so much as renowned to get celebrations in its name, to be the topic of books and artwork, to be the bane of ancient mathematicians? Is there a number that comes close to the power that that has, the intelligence that that has, the profile that that has, the international implications that that Of course, I'm talking about pi, otherwise known as 3.14159 and so on and so on. What is pi? Why is it so special and so famous? Why does it have infinitely many digits? And how did we discover that fact? Is it true that pi contains every sequence of numbers inside of it? How are we able to calculate so many digits with accuracy? And why do we even bother at all? In this video, we'll take a look at all those questions and more, but first, some pi. Hmm. Hi guys, so I'm in Britain right now and they've got these things called mince pies filled with mincemeat. Not to be confused with minced meat, that's what they call ground meat. No, mincemeat is sweet and fruity and it's also meant to be a holiday treat but it's September. I don't really know, but pi, the mathematical constant, is the ratio of a circle's circumference, which is the distance all the way around it, to its diameter, which is the distance all the way across it. And humans have known about it for a very long time. Imagine that you're a prehistoric human and you've dug a circular well in the ground. I didn't actually want to dig a circular well in the ground, so we're just going to pretend this hula hoop is the well. And the question is, how many rocks do you need to create a layer of rocks going around the well? Alright, so we're going to make things simple. We're just going to do one layer of rocks. And the well is about one arm's length across. If you just carry as many rocks as you can carry, then you might end up with too many and you'll have wasted your energy doing it. But if you don't bring enough rocks, you'll have to do another trip, which you also don't want to do. So how do you get the best estimate of how many rocks you need to go around it? Well, you can just measure the distance around the well and then bring that many rocks. So let's just say that this is a starting point. How long is the distance around it? Well, that's one, two, and three. So if you go out and collect a bunch of rocks and then line them up and see if it's three arms lengths, then that should be enough to go around the well. But we can do better than this. After all, an arm's length is a pretty crude measurement. Now the question we want to answer is how many times does the distance across the circle fit into the distance around the circle? The struggle with this problem is that the circle is so curved and we can't really line up a measuring stick to it. But there is one way that we can flatten the circle. So let me mark one point of the circle here that will be my start and finish point and then I put a rock here and then I'll roll it in a straight line to there and then the distance between these two rocks will roughly be the distance around the whole circle. Now how many times does the diameter fit into that distance? Well let's just line it up. You have one two, and three, and a little bit. What is that little bit? Is it three and a half? Doesn't really look like it. it is it 3.1, 3.2? Now, saying three-ish or three plus a little bit extra might have worked if you were just building a little well and putting rocks around it, but what about when people started wanting to make bridges or started wanting to make domes that could fit hundreds of people inside? Three-ish isn't gonna cut it anymore. We're gonna start having to be more precise than that. One Babylonian tablet from almost 4,000 years ago gives a value of 3.125 for pi. The rind papyrus from around 1650 BC shows us that the Egyptians used a value of 3.1605. You can try to measure it for yourself by finding some sort of circle in your house and measuring the distance around it using a string and then use a separate string across the circle and divide those two numbers. You'll get something close to the correct answer, but how do we even know what the correct answer is at all? How are we able to calculate millions and millions of digits of pi? How do we know that these are the correct ones? Is there some billionaire out there with a super sophisticated measuring stick? Well, Archimedes of Syracuse came up with a really brilliant way to calculate pi all the way in the 200s BC. And it didn't involve any measuring sticks and it allowed you to calculate pi to as much precision as you want using an iterative process. So the same calculation over and over. 
He started by making a circle with a radius of 1. That would mean that the diameter is 2 and the circumference of the circle is 2 pi. And then he inscribed a hexagon inside the circle and figured that the circle's circumference was pretty close to the perimeter of this hexagon. But the thing is, we can calculate the perimeter of the hexagon easily and exactly. Now, a hexagon is made up of six equilateral triangles, all with 60 degree angles, and the side lengths are all one because the lines that go from the center to the edge of the circle are the radii of the circle with length 1. Adding up the 6 sides of the hexagon gives us a perimeter of 6. Now if we're to believe that this is a rough approximation for the circle's circumference, that would give us a value of 3 for pi, which is not very good. But his genius invention was the next step. Take each side of the hexagon and drag the midpoint up to the edge of the circle, and that turns the one edge into two new edges in blue. And we end up going from a six-sided polygon to a 12-sided polygon that approximates the circle even better because there's less empty space. So the more sides it has, the closer it looks like a circle. If we can calculate the length of one of the 12 sides, which I'll call A, then 12 times A, which would be the perimeter of the 12-sided polygon, a dodecagon, ought to be a better approximation of the circle's circumference than the hexagon was. So how can we calculate A? Well, we know that this side length is 1 because it's a radii of the circle, and so is this long side. This length is 0.5 because it's half of a side of a hexagon, and these angles here are both right angles. So we have two right angle triangles here, meaning we can just use the Pythagorean theorem to solve for the unknown sides. We'll have to do a couple of intermediate steps in the middle, but then we'll end up with a value for A, which we then plug into our equation, and we end up getting an approximation of pi of 3.1056 which was much better than just 3. And Archimedes said that we can continue this process of next making a 24-sided polygon, and just adding more and more sides to get closer to the circle and thus get closer to pi. Another observation he made was that if you put hexagons inside and outside the circle, that would be called inscribing and circumscribing, that would provide a lower and an upper bound for pi, which you could even take the average up to get a better approximation before even moving up to the 12-sided figure. Now in his day, they didn't use decimal notation or algebra or trigonometry just yet, but he was able to make these great leaps and bounds just by knowing about simple geometry and ratios. This method was the dominant method for about a thousand years, and another name for pi is Archimedes constant. The symbol for pi is actually just a letter in the Greek alphabet, it didn't get commonly associated with a number until the 1700s AD. Anyway, a similar approach was discovered by Zhu Chongzi, a Chinese mathematician and astronomer. We don't know much about his method because his books are lost, but he did calculate pi to 355 over 113, which was even more accurate than Archimedes could get. He would have had to have inscribed polygon with 24,576 sides and have been working with numbers with 9 decimal places all by hand. His would be the most accurate approximation of pi for the next 800 years. But what's important is not what Archimedes and Zhu Chengzi were able to calculate, but rather how they calculated it. They turned what was once a matter of just crude measurement into a matter of geometry, multiplication, square roots, subtractions. This meant that we were no longer limited by our measuring sticks, we could throw those out the window. The only thing limiting us now was how much time we're willing to spend calculating this boring task. But it was a challenge for mathematicians to come up with new ways to calculate pi that could give us more precision and more digits. The next big development in the history of pi would have been the discovery of the infinite series, which happened in India around the year 1400. This turned what was once a geometric problem into a purely arithmetic one. One of the most famous is pi over 4 equals 1 minus 1 third plus 1 fifth minus 1 seventh plus 1 ninth. You just keep going adding and subtracting these smaller and smaller fractions and wherever you choose to stop that process you'll have approximated pi. If we just want the first thousand digits, if we want to know the first million digits, we can add and subtract over and over until we get as precise as we like. We just can't do it infinitely. This graph here shows record approximations of pi over time, and as you see, there's a huge breakthrough in the 1950s. And that was, of course, thanks to the invention of the computer, which changed everything. Kine, isn't this so much work? Surely we don't need to know that many digits of pi. As a matter of fact, most engineers use only four or five digits at most in their calculations, and that's enough. Knowing the rest of the digits won't help us build stronger bridges or faster cars, so is there any practical use to knowing the first 10,000 digits of pi? 
If you don't count winning pie memorization contests as a practical application, the world record for which is 70,000 digits blindfolded, then not really, but mathematicians can't resist a challenge. It's not just what we've approximated, but how we approximated it. The innovation of using iterative processes by Archimedes had to have been one of the most important discoveries of all time, and people call him one of the greatest mathematicians to ever live, and for good reason. It was a precursor to infinitesimal calculus, which is vital to physics, engineering, finance, computing. You know, lots of math starts out with someone saying, hmm, this looks like an interesting challenge, let me take this on. And then it's not until later that we find some great practical application out of it. If we could raise Archimedes from the dead and give him a tour of the 21st century, what would he think of the world as it is 2,000 years later? Would he ever believe that his work played a vital role in the technology that we use today? Technology that he never could have even dreamt of. Hmm. Why is it that the digits of pi go on forever? Wouldn't it be easier if pi was just three exactly, or three and a half, or even 3.1? Well, we don't exactly get to choose what pi is. It's part of the mechanics of nature. We only discovered it. First, we have to make a distinction because lots of people say things like pi is infinite, which is not really technically correct. Pi has infinitely many digits after the decimal, but it is a finite number. And as a matter of fact, every single number is a finite number because infinity is not a number on the number line. It's more like the size of the number line. But infinity can take up a whole episode on its own. Consider the fact that one third equals 0 0.3 repeating and the threes never come to an end. So a third also has infinitely many digits. So does two thirds. So does 674,831 over 999. So does one over 99. I can name infinitely many numbers that each have infinitely many digits. But what makes pi different is that the digits of pi never repeat. Numbers that have repeating digits are called rational numbers. These are all rational numbers. All whole numbers, positive and negative, are also rational, and anything else that terminates, like 0 0.5, negative 0 0.123, or 3.14. A number is rational when it can be expressed as a fraction of two whole numbers. Whenever a number can be expressed as a fraction of two whole numbers, the digits of it will always terminate or repeat, and vice versa. If the digits of a number terminate or repeat, then that number can be written as a fraction. But pi is irrational, meaning the digits don't repeat or terminate. There is no hope of writing down pi explicitly, in the digits or even as a fraction, which is why we have to use a symbol for it. Whenever you go to write down 3.14159, the moment you stop writing digits, you've just written down a number that is not pi, you've just approximated it. The reason we know pi is irrational is because of a man named Lambert, who proved this fact in the 1760s. After all, it could have just been the case that after a billion digits, the digits of pi just repeat from the beginning, making it rational. Lambert started by proving that the tangent function was equivalent to this expression. Then he said that if x is rational, then this expression, the tangent of x, must be irrational, and vice versa. But if x is pi over 4, then the tangent of pi over 4 is 1, which is rational, thus ending his proof that pi is irrational. Now, we don't really deal with irrational numbers in our day-to-day -day lives. We're used to using whole numbers, and if we have to deal with decimals, we round it off after a few digits. So an irrational number like pi might feel like a unicorn of a number, but actually most numbers are irrational. Pi plus 1 is irrational, so is pi squared, and pi but replace every 4 with a 7. The square root of 2 is irrational, so is the square root of 2 times 5, or for that matter, the square root of any non-perfect square. There are infinitely many rationals, but an even greater infinity in the number of irrationals. If the rational numbers were like infinite stars in the sky, the irrationals would be like the blackness between the stars. A lot of people also throw around the story that pi has every single sequence of numbers inside of it, like your phone number is somewhere in pi, the Bible encoded into numbers is somewhere in pi. This would depend on the digits of pi having a uniformly random distribution, which is only conjecture and thus not necessarily true. As far as we can tell, the digits of pi definitely appear to be random. The finite number of digits that we know pass our tests of randomness, and people actually use it as a random number generator because it does seem so random. But feeling random and being random are two different things. One of them comes with a much higher standard of proof. Having infinitely many digits that never terminate and never repeat is definitely interesting to wrap one's head around, but it's not really a quality that makes pi unique. 
So why then are people obsessed with Pi? Why do we celebrate Pi Day on March 14th? Or is it just me that does that? Why is Pi such a famous number? I don't really know, but my guess is that it's to do with the mystery, the complexity, and the strangeness of its irrationality. For the past 4,000 years, we've tried to unlock its secrets and find out exactly what its digits were, only to discover that any attempt at writing it down would fail, because we have no hope of ever writing down infinitely many digits. Its complexity and strangeness has captured the brightest of our imaginations, and yet this is just a simple ratio to do with the simplest shape out there, a circle. When you first learn about shapes, you probably learn about circles the same time you learn about squares and triangles. But if you really think about it, a circle is so much more fundamental to nature. I mean, how many times do you see squares and triangles out there in the natural world? But there are circles in our eyes, in the sky, in the heads of flowers, in the trunks of trees. When a raindrop hits still water, it makes circular ripples. If you want to build a theater where everyone is as close as possible to the stage, you make it circular. The more you look, the more you see circles everywhere in nature both visually and in the laws of physics. I recommend watching three blue, one browns videos on pi to see how pi appears in the most random physics equations where you would never expect to encounter it. And the reason why is because there are circles hidden within the physics. So perhaps pi is the celebrity that it is because the circle is a shape that is so important, so elementary and fundamental to our world. And it's also tasty. Oh my God. Oh my God. Oh my god, it melted. <laughs> <laughs>